Nobles? Sure. Hey, I'm Nobles Crawford. Uh, been on this committee for, I believe, two years almost. So welcome okay. to Zoom. Sally? Hi, Sally Fisher. Um, on the committee, um, I've been going for years, but on the committee, I think this is my second meeting. And um, go out to the parks. <laughs> okay, Daryl? Hi, good evening, Daryl Cochran. Uh, on the committee four years. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, and if you can toggle your audio a little bit because we were having a little trouble hearing you. Uh, Danielle? I'm Danielle, can you hear me? Yep. I've been on the board for two years, but on the Traffic and transportation. Okay, and I just, I also want to note that uh, we are recording this meeting. Um, uh, we've got uh, Jonathan Nunez from Meta, who is our uh, Community Board 12 uh, IT Chair. We've got uh, Jamari Smith, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hi. Hi, everybody. Hello. Uh, it's it nice to be here with you. I hope that we can work together a lot in this. I'm so excited and please stay safe. Thank you. Welcome. Jamadis is one of our public members. We've got Alexis Marnell, our other public member. You want to introduce yourself? Hi, Alexis Marnell. Been a public member, I think, for a little over, uh, little over a year now. Excellent. And Francisco Lopez. You want to unmute yourself, Francisco, and introduce yourself? Hello, can you guys hear me? We can, we can now. now. Yes. Awesome. Uh, happy Monday, everybody. My name is Francisco. I've been on the board for about, I want to say, two, two years. Has it been two years? Yep. Yeah, some, some around like that. <laughs> and I am just, you know, extremely passionate about my community, and that's why I'm here, and um, so grateful to still be here with you guys. Excellent. And um, Francisco and Jamadis, can you turn on your video? Video. Mm -hmm. I'm actually having a real bad hair day. Ah. <laughs> who is it? Okay. I mean, who is it? <laughs> but is I... Hold on, hold on. Let me let me figure this out. I'm like an old guy. <laughs> Oh, hey, there he you is. don't have enough hair to have a bad hair day. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna, in, because there's a lot of different background noise, I'm going to ask people to put themselves on mute um, unless you're speaking. Um, unfortunately, I have not actually figured out how to use the mute all button. Um, so that's good for you. I can't exercise that awesome power. Um, but not that, I, not that I would do that to you anyway. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the, um, Alexis, can you put yourself on mute? There we go. Uh, Liz. Okay. Uh, just one more thing. Just one more thing, Liz. Can you yes. um, identify from the attendees side who else needs to be promoted to um, panelist side? Because we have 13 attendees and we don't know who of them needs to be panelist. Um, nobody. All of all of the folks okay. who are um, all of the folks who are attendees. Uh, I think they can ask their hey. questions in the in the chat box, and uh, I think we'll do it that way. Okay. Um, are you gonna be, can? Yeah, I mean, there's next to everybody's name, I have the ability to toggle on allow to talk. So I think we can we can just work it that way. Um, does that nod your heads committee members if that works for you? Excellent. So first, I just want to apologize that as um, as Julie McCoy said, this is a time of learning. And uh, there are many things that are incredibly humbling about uh, COVID-19 and one of them is how much I think we all are learning about technology, new platforms, new ways of living our lives, new ways of interacting with each other and dealing with 
Um, I don't want to say social distancing. I don't like that phrase. I want to call it uh, physical distancing while maintaining social connection. It's a little bit longer, but I think it's a better description of what we all really need to be doing. Um, I think these times are incredibly difficult. Uh, there's a lot to say about all of this. Uh, and I just want to keep in mind that, if, I want everybody to keep in mind that because this is the Parks and Cultural Affairs Committee, we're going to stay focused on Parks and Cultural Affairs. So while there are many, many announcements and pieces of information about health, about housing, about the environment, about uh, rents and small businesses and the economy and schools and food distribution and mental health and so many other things. I want to try and stay really focused on the things that are the purview of this committee, which is uh, parks and cultural affairs. So um, in no particular order, um, welcome everybody. Happy Easter, happy Passover, happy almost Ramadan, um, happy spring. As you can see behind me, wait, no, I gotta go this way. Uh, you can see behind me, spring is really sprung. I'll be changing my background pictures of um, to show different parks throughout the community um, that I have on my camera roll. Although we are supposed to be um, staying physically separate from people who are other than those who are in our households we are incredibly lucky uptown to have hundreds and hundreds of acres of parks and even though the playgrounds are closed and under no circumstances should we be playing basketball or tennis or soccer or any other contact sports we have lots of places where we can be uh, walking, enjoying nature, um, seeing just the incredible beauty that surrounds us, um, getting some exercise, which is good for our physical health and also for our mental health. Um, there's a lot of information on the parks website for uh, maps of parks, trails maps, um, if you need places to go where you can uh, you know, be alone or at least not be too crowded, that's a really useful resource. Um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, the borough president and to her incredibly hardworking staff who have been um, delivering to everybody's inboxes a really informative uh, newsletter every day that has lots of information about many of the things that I named at the top of the meeting that we won't be discussing, but also lots of offerings at museums, at libraries, uh, at you know Lincoln Center, dance programs, the Children's Museum has educational programs for people with kids. I'll be sharing a document where I pulled some of those things together. There are book clubs, you can read you can read War and Peace with people all over the globe and get into a, a global discussion um, called uh, through the hashtag Tolstoy Together. Uh, the New York Public Library is making all kinds of books available for free. There are book clubs. There are many, many, many things to do to keep ourselves from going completely nuts. And I just touched my face. My bad. Um, so uh, with that, a uh, couple of updates um, from last month at our meeting, which I have to say feels like 150 years ago. Uh, we met on March 10th, uh, was one of the last meetings that the community board had before the governor's executive order banning meetings of any kind. Um, and we passed a resolution uh, incorporating our feedback on uh, what we wanted the Parks Department to know about our preferences and thoughts and requirements for the use of the concession in uh, Fort Tryon Park. Um, we had a very lengthy, very well thought out resolution, which we passed unanimously, and which I suspect the full board would have passed unanimously had we been in normal times and had the opportunity to discuss it with the full board. We didn't, so um, 
what I did was I took those minutes, which I have sent to you and which um, I've sent also to the board office and the board office will be sending, uh, making available to the public. Uh, I sent that to the parks department so that they have the benefit of all of our comments um, and they've advised me that they have received it and they will be um, you know, taking all of that seriously. So um, that's that. Uh, we don't actually have an update. I'm just gonna look away to see if we've got Luis on the call. We do not, so we don't have an update on the Lenape street co-naming. That's not a particularly time sensitive matter, so we can take it up uh, next month if there's an update and hopefully have something to send to the city council in time for their um, uh, legislative session where they discuss street co namings in June. Um, and yeah, and I hope that in everybody's copious spare time, uh, people have taken a moment to complete the census because uh, that is the one thing that affects all of the community board um, committees. So, with that, I want to open it up. Um, Jennifer Hoppe is not on the call. She is uh, a, a little under the weather, not with COVID. Um, so we don't have a report from Parks, but I think really the news from Parks I kind of gave in the recap and I will be including in the information about some of the things to do in Parks later in the meeting. So with that, I'd like to open it up for some brief programming updates from our various, um, oh, actually, before I do that, I wanna call on Daryl, who, while this is not strictly a parks and cultural affairs issue, accessibility is something that touches on um, all of us. And in, uh, in addition to being our, um, uh, committee co-chair, Daryl is also a senior person at the uh, Commission on Human Rights. So you want to talk a little bit about some of the accessibility issues related to all of this? Sure. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Awesome. Um, good evening, everyone. Good to see you. I um, hope you're well and safe and healthy. Um, just a you know, brief update from the City Commission on Human Rights. Uh, we are the city agency that enforces the non-discrimination laws. Um, you know, I will say overall uh, that uh, discrimination, uh, particularly what we consider discriminatory harassment, has been down, um, often because that takes place on the streets, in the subway, or, or other public transportation. And just, you know, fact is not a lot of people are taking it as much. Um, but the unfortunate side with this um, is with the coronavirus that some people have been more discriminatory towards a few different communities, uh, primarily the Asian community, uh, as well as Jewish and to some extent the LGBT community as well. Um, so we, we are tracking cases uh, between our agency, the Office for the Prevention of Hate Crimes, as well as the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, so that is something we're coordinating and tracking for the past uh, month now. Um, you know, and I, I think where we, where people are gathering, um, hopefully at a socially uh, responsible distance, um, are the parks. Like Liz mentioned, we do have a lot of parks up here, obviously. So, you know, people are gathering in that way. Um, but I haven't heard of a lot of instances um, in parks themselves, uh, thankfully. So did you have any specific questions? I'm happy to answer and talk more about. Um, just looking at the chat, I'm not seeing specific questions. Uh, do folks on the committee have particular questions about accessibility? Nobles. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, hey, Daryl. So when it comes to discrimination, I'm assuming you're, I mean, this also, Liz, let me know if this is kind of outside of parks and cultural affairs. I'm thinking it's probably more the cultural affairs piece here. Are you also tracking online discrimination too? Or is it just, you know, 
physical? That's a good question. Yeah, we definitely heard of instances where there's Zoom bombing. Um, uh, you know, that people have been entering these Zoom conversations um, unwelcomely and uh, spouting some sort of racist or other discriminatory, uh, you know, slurs. Uh, we've seen less of that. I think because of that, people have started putting passwords um, and whatnot uh, on these type of meetings. Um, but yeah, we haven't, uh, I don't think we've tracked that, but that is definitely something that we're talking about, um, and seeing really, because a lot of these are private conversations, uh, are people aware that they could tell us about that? Um, I'm not sure. And that's, and trying to create that awareness is, is one thing that we're looking at. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I get that it's a little bit ironic that um, in the interest of privacy, we require passwords now for Zoom meetings, but I posted on Facebook what the password was so that everybody could get into the Zoom meeting because since this is a community board meeting, subject to the uh, open meetings law, we have to invite the public in and enable uh, you know, full public access. So. You know, it's a little bit of a, for lack of a better term, a, it's a bit of a crapshoot on how we make sure that people have some privacy um, and have some security given that, you know, Zoom is not exactly a military level privacy um, platform, but it is really easy and everybody knows how to use it and it's very accessible. So, you know, we pick our we pick our poisons. So with that, um, let me move on. Thank you, Daryl. You know, um, can I add one more thing? Please do. You know, I think particularly in, in our community, uh, being so close to New York Presbyterian, um, if you do hear things um, related to, to this, please also let us know. Um, we have seen a few cases, and one was in the New York Times, uh, which actually brought out a few other people, um, where people are, who are wanting to volunteer as doctors or nurses or some sort of other uh, health aides at these hospitals that may not live in the area, but they have friends or family that live in the area. And then when these friends or family are lending them their apartments, uh, particularly in co-op or condo situations, we've heard of some boards uh, not allowing these particular guests because they are working in hospitals um, or other medical settings. So, um, you know, if that's something you hear of too, please let us know. And how do we contact you to let you know that? The easiest way is call 311 and ask for human rights. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, next up we've got uh, Sally Fisher. You wanna talk a little bit about what's going on with uh, Friends of Inwood Hill Park? You gotta unmute yourself. Really isolated and distant um, stewardship. Um, we'll be announcing some um, events coming up where people can actually borrow equipment, gloves, um, grabbers, et cetera, to do some tree care stewardship on their own. Um, and that's about it. The park's beautiful. Um, have another week on the Dutchman breaches, which are my favorite flowers to get out to the parks. Um, and as everybody knows, playgrounds, dog runs, et cetera, are closed. Um, no team sports, but otherwise there's a lot of room to move around. And that's it. I have one note on the Washington Heights Inwood Food Council, which is for those who are interested, we are doing a bilingual virtual yoga this Wednesday at seven o'clock on Facebook Live. Cool, thank you. Um, I'm gonna bring um, Jennifer Hoppe on so that she can give a brief parks report. Um, hold on, I, more, wait a second. Uh, Jen, I'm gonna promote you to a panelist. Uh, so Jen Hoppe will be joining us in a moment. 
as a panelist? Um, also, Sally, I'm going to put you back on mute, but when you go into speaking mode, if you could just move closer to your mic because it was hard to hear you. Hello, Jen Hoppe. I feel like we're the Brady Bunch. Yeah. Alice, turn on your mic. Right. Um, so I just want to remind everybody, I think m people may have seen uh, former Parks Commissioner Adrian Benepe's uh, editorial in the Daily News, but parks are really serving as our, our cathedrals, um, our sanctuaries, our places for nourishment, rest, um, and our parks workers are considered essential workers. Sorry about that. Um, so we're out, we're working, um, and uh, I, I hope everyone will thank a park worker that when they see them, um, they're putting their lives on the line, traveling on public transportation, um, urban park rangers, park enforcement, uh, everyone. Um, because I think we all realize in the parks we're totally committed to making as much of our parkland available to the public as possible. Psychologically, physiologically, mentally, it's just so key to our healing and well-being. Um, as Sally mentioned, our playgrounds, our sports courts, our skate parks, our dog runs are closed because of some challenges with social distancing enforcement, um, but otherwise um, we've got uh, close to 600 acres of park for people to enjoy. Um, Highbridge Park has a map you can download. Inwood Hill Park has a map you can download to take advantage of its 10 miles of paths. Fort Tryonis Park you can download. They've got eight mi we've got eight miles of pathway there. Um, so this is an opportunity to explore and discover. And obviously when you see groups of people, move on. We've got enough land uh, to ensure that everybody's um, using it respectfully. Um, public programs obviously are, are closed for the foreseeable future. Um, so again, online resources are, are something that everyone should take advantage of. How many people have heard of the Parks at Home series? anyone? So the Parks Department recognizes that uh, not everyone feels safe going outside or uh, can only go outside in, in, uh, during certain times uh, since people are working at home. So now there's a platform, um, Parks at Home, um, that you can link on. You can do, it will lead you in meditation using um, park context um, for visual and, and psychological well-being. Um, there are virtual tours. The Urban Park Rangers just did one on geology in Inwood Hill Park. Um, that's really fun to uh, uh, watch and, and be a part of uh, the Inwood context. Um, there are also workouts that you can do in your kitchen or in, in little portions of your apartment uh, led by Parks Recreation staff. So that's one set of resources. And the Fortrain Park Trust also has um, some fun virtual uh, tours. Um, the 85th anniversary memory book is up. If you wanna sort of see the park through the, the eight um, plus decades of its life, and you can still add to it, you can send uh, your favorite park memory to info at fortrainparktrust.org. Um, but they're birding, birding resources, uh, history resources, um, scavenger hunts for kids on the Fort Tryon Park Trust website. So between parks and the trust, we're trying to make as much available to people to have a deeper experience when they're out actually using the park, as well as bring the parks into people's homes. Um, what format do you want uh, submissions for the Fort Tryon Park uh, memory book. You can send a, a JPEG, you know, um, with uh, your memory in the body of an email. It doesn't have to be high tech. Um, we've had some people who maybe are more technologically challenged. They put everything in a Word document and sent it to us. Um, so, 
Thank you. And also, is it true that the Fort Tryon Park Trust uh, bought uh, uh, lunch for the park, Uptown Park staff today from the Tryon Alehouse? Yes, that's correct. Uh, the Fort Tryon Trust bought lunch for all of the park workers uptown today, uh, supporting a local business and supporting our, our frontline workers. So, Thanks. Nobles. Nice. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, and anyone on this call for the parks. I mean, it's an absolute godsend. I love being on this committee. I love the parks in Northern Manhattan. Thank God you guys are still open and functioning. And I do thank all the park workers all the time when I go there. Um, just a quick question on the streets. So I know that the mayor has kind of uh, pulled back from closing streets down because there are no staff there to kind of, you know, protect it uh, from a police perspective, considering all the call outs. Before Tryon, when it comes to Margaret Corbin, they have gates. Has there been any conversation around closing Margaret Corbin to give some folks, at least maybe even on the weekends, to give some folks a little bit more walking uh, distance? I think it's been considered, but I think because Uptown has one of the highest open space ratios of any community on the island, um, focus was put elsewhere. Downtown, you know, community boards two, community boards four, community board six, uh, those are, and community board three, those are communities that have very little uh, park space, whereas we have 660 acres uptown. Um, so I think uh, it, it, we weren't made a priority area because we have such an abundance of space to spread out in. Yeah, my understanding also is that enforcement is a little bit of a challenge um, because PD resources are stretched super thin that uh, requiring them to have to enforce that kind of road closure when there's already so many things going on, we do have so much open space, was, was a little bit of an issue as well. Yeah. Last, la am I on, okay. lastly, yeah. I, one issue was keeping that road open for emergency services. Oh wait, hold on a second, it's seven o'clock. Yeah. Every day it gets louder. Just gonna open my window. Yay! That's kind of awesome. They deserve it. I don't know what other people's neighborhoods sound like, but Inwood represents. Okay, we got uh, Francisco. Hey guys, just a quick question. I know it's only been a month, but ha has there been any studies or anything said about the impact on the parks with, without people, you know, throwing their trash everywhere? Huh without people in general being outside messing with the parks and the environment so the the question is what what has the impact been on the volume of trash that we collect no the the quality of the parks uh, flowers blooming or, or, or things going on that right. weren't happening before because there were people getting in the way of that is there anything right. new revelations with the parks not as of yet no i mean thankfully for the most part like the parks and the people using them have been, you know, working and, and pretty com compatible. I think where we, you know, we, we still have some dumping of television screens, you know, uh, construction dumping, things like that at our park, re restaurant dumping on the park perimeters. Um, but we haven't necessarily seen an uptick or a reduction in that yet. Um, I think maybe a few months out. How about uh, rats? You know, what we have, we do have, um, you know, less areas where we can bait for rats because we do have a very active hawk, you know, population. Okay. You don't want to hurt, you know, yes, everybody wants to eradicate rats, but the hawks and other birds ingest them. And so then if they're, the rats have ingested poison, you in turn uh, hurt the birds of prey. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna uh, bring Danielle in. 
Um, will you mind just repeating how to access the exercise sessions that you mentioned? Before? Oh, sure. I, um, I, let's see if I, I'm, I'm a little bit technologically challenged. Let's see if I can open another window. If you go, go to parks, um, the Parks Department's website. Mm -hmm. It's www.nyc.gov backslash parks. Mm -hmm. And besides like COVID information on the main page, you'll see a parks at home image. Okay. And within that, there are um, uh, four different categories. Let's see if I can do it on my phone while we're on. I think I go to the park to avoid the internet, so I haven't actually looked at parks work. <laughs> Got it. So I would actually strongly encourage people to um, check out the Parks Department website. It is, it is incredibly informative. Um, and there are lots of, there are maps, there are links to programs. And while, you know, so many of us are using the internet for our jobs and Zoom for our jobs, and it's kind of a bummer to use these same technologies as entertainment, um, pretend it's not the internet. And uh, you, can, you can get to really good culture, meditation, exercise, all kinds of stuff. And information on park equity. Uh, facility closings, um, different reports, trail maps. Uh, so it's pretty comprehensive. Jennifer, I just had a quick question. Are we- Wait, Sally, hold, hold on. Uh, were you done, Je uh, Danielle? Um, I was actually just gonna ask about the trail maps. I, I haven't actually seen any maps like when you enter the park. Am I missing, are, are they, are there actual maps that, outline trails um so in, yes and no so when you go to inwood hill to different trailheads um the trail the trail map is there and it tells you you are here um and then the ranger publication on inwood has a, a version of that too those are generally handed out though at events um because just leaving them out they tend to you know um, just become litter everywhere. Um, but the Inwood trail map is also downloadable uh, if, you, if you're somebody who wants to study the map and plan your route before you go on Park's website. Um, Highbridge, we have a hard copy brochure. Um, I've brought, I don't know if you were there when we had the, um, the meeting at the Fundacion, the Juan Bosch uh, uh, Foundation. Juan Pablo out, Duarte. Oh, Juan Pablo Duarte, okay, lo siento. Um, in English and Spanish. And that has um, a park map of Highbridge and then um, information on each of its amenities. And then Fort Tryon is downloadable as well. Usually the hard copies are handed out when there's an event. Um, so you either have to look at the park map at the park entrances or download it for the time being. Um, and there are also copies at the community board office. Like a, a physical map at the entrance of the parks or? But that sense. So that's we have that in place in in, in places at in Inwood Hill on the trail uh, route um, and at each of the entrances and then at Fort Tryon Park and Highbridge has been approved uh, using the new citywide system that the Public Design Commission had to sign off on. Um, so that's like next in the queue to be installed um, for each of the park entrances as well as for. Uh, where different trails converge and you might not know what amenity is ahead so that in hybrid it's still in process got it thank you cool uh before i bring sally in for the question that she had i just want to bring aisha in so she can introduce herself you're in say hi hi How, how's everybody doing tonight you're a member of the committee i'm a member of the committee um, my name is Aisha Oglevin. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Lynn, can you mention who's the stack? I'm just curious. Okay, so right now on the stack, we've got uh, Sarah and the, uh, Sally, and then you, and then I want to, and then I think we're done on this piece of the meeting, and I want to move on to the folks who are doing their. Um, uh, brief updates on their organizations. Sally? Hi, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just don't see a raised hand thing on my screen. 
So um, since you're on video, you can physically raise your hand and I will see that. Great. Um, just a question. Are we providing um, parks workers with PPE? Parks workers has been provided uh, with PPE um, and more in route. Um, I'm sure no one is unaware that um, medical you know, professionals have had a uh, shortage in PPE. Um, I know some of the supply orders that we placed over a month ago still haven't been shipped. My, my expectation is things that were in the queue for us got redirected to uh, higher priority uh, sites, people who are interfacing with um, patients. Um, but the agency is continuing to try to, to source more. Um, Thanks. So. Thanks. Thanks. Daryl? Yeah, I had two questions. Uh, one, uh, I was wondering, has there any been any thought to temporarily opening up parts of Gorman Park? Or would any of that be safe to open up during this time? So the upper plaza remains open. That's sort of like, like an outdoor patio with the beautiful monument. That's open. Um, because of the, uh, the structural, you know, the engineering issues um, and that section of retaining wall collapsing, it's not uh, safe to, the parks engineers have deemed it unsafe for public through access, so. Okay, and the bottom part is the same, I think. The bottom part is the sidewalk, you know, otherwise it's essentially just one long staircase, meandering staircase. Um, and then a mid-level terrace, and then the upper terrace, which is open. Okay. And then the other question I had today is the, and I'm not sure if this is you, maybe Liz would know, uh, today is the 150-year anniversary for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, which includes the cloisters, obviously. And I didn't know if there were any events that were supposed to be happening for the anniversary. And if so, have those been moved to another date that we know of? So the Cloisters is actually, Fort Troyan Park is 85 years old. The Cloisters is, uh, I believe, four full years younger. So it's in its 81st year. So it may, it, it may be sort of on a different track than the main branch of the Met. Um, that said, uh, the Fort Troyan Park Trust has been working with the, the Met Cloisters on some special programs related to events, uh, related to exhibits come the fall. Um, thank you, Daryl, for giving me the opportunity to use one of my favorite words, sesquicentennial, which means <laughs> 150th. So I just want to say what's this, I'm going to thank you, Jennifer, for your report and thank you for dialing in. I appreciate it. All right. Um, I just want, I'm gonna move back to the item three of the agenda, which is the brief programming updates. And I'm gonna um, just say what the stack is right now. If you, and I'll call on you one by one and then toggle you to allow you to speak. Um, and if you don't hear me call your name, then you can hit the little raise your hand feature. If you hear me call your name, you don't need to raise your hand because I will, call you on the stack. So I've got Ryan Desso, Amanda Kraus, Julie McCoy, Jen Bristol, Alex Campos, Shiloh Holly, Anastasia Galco, Joanna Castro, Marty Collins, Trish Anderton, and Nancy Fiaschetti. So Liz? Can you add me to that stack um, so that I can speak on behalf of PRX? Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, bringing in Ryan Desso. Uh, okay. Ryan, I think I've got you unmuted. I'm there we go. Myself. Yep. <laughs> Hello? We can hear you. Oh, you can hear? Okay. How are you guys doing? Doing all right. It's good to hear your voice, man. Uh, yeah, it's good to see your guys' faces. Uh, it, I guess it's um, through the visuals, I guess. Uh, it's good to be able to uh, at least have that connection. I mean, we can't have the same energy like we're in the same room, but at least we can 
you know, we know each other's mannerisms enough. And we've seen, I mean, at least just from going to the meetings for a little over a year, being able to understand the people's energy and stuff. So it's kind of good to see the faces through the visuals. You can get the energy feel. So it's good to see everyone doing well. Okay. You got a particular program that you're wanting to announce or that was um, general hello from no, the No, it's, it's kind of um, confusing, I guess, at this moment because, it's, like I said, it's, it's hard because you don't want to go against the city and kind of like, you know, point out, hey, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. Uh, I mean, I have a pretty good uh, observation, pretty um, honest one. And it's, it, it's, it's tough because you don't know where the, the, the calls are being made, you know. It almost seems as if it's like state level. So it's kind of above, but it's, it's, it's as though we have the answers, I believe. Uh, we have this land that we talk about. And I think that once, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm on time. Sorry if I'm taking up too much. But I just feel that we're at a retrograde right now, the, the whole world, but especially the United States and the city. It's, uh, we're moving so slow that it, you know, it almost feels as though we're moving backwards. So once this, I guess, restart or whenever, you know, the government starts, you know, sets that date when you can go back to the library, you can go back into the parks, I think we'll have a better idea of how we can start programming uh, with, with more uh, to come. Because I, like you said, it's day to day. Because the library is supposed to be open on March 31st and that's, that didn't happen. And then the parks got closed after the libraries and certain government buildings. So it's just kind of confusing. You don't want to um, jump the gun on certain things. So just kind of playing it by ear. Okay. Yeah, I mean, frankly, as are we all. Um, yeah, I just appreciate that at least the city's making the effort to have the meetings because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to be connected. And then also, um, I mean, this is a humbling experience for everybody. Even celebrities, everybody, everybody's affected by this. So it's kind of like, uh, I guess not pointing the finger so much right now, I guess it's just kind of when can we have this start date that we can really start moving forward, I guess. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, next we've got, uh, I'm bringing in Amanda Kraus. Hello? Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Hi, good to see you all. Um, yeah, so I'm, calling in from Rome, New York, and um, also super grateful to the Parks Department um, for just giving us New Yorkers throughout the city access to space. It's huge. It's more important than ever, so thank you. Um, we obviously suspended our programs out of the boathouse on the Harlem River, and now we're running remote support for our student athletes in Washington Heights and Wood, Bronx, throughout Manhattan. Um, they're doing virtual tutoring, social worker is very busy, um, and then even some virtual workouts together with their teammates. So we're trying to do a lot to support our student athletes, even though we're not physically with them. Um, and I'll keep this short because I, I know it's a long list. I think in, in good news, I mentioned this to Liz earlier today, um, you know, we imagine that we would be tapping the brakes on this boathouse project um, the Boathouse and Learning Center behind PS5 when the coronavirus, you know, struck and the city shut down. But we do have funding to move forward for at least three months, um, which is really great because we're uh, at a really pivotal point and a crucial stage in the development of the building with the Parks Department and infrastructure for utilities and um, permitting, et cetera. So we're really happy about that. And we'll certainly update the community board after June when we know, you know, what happens after that. But as of right now, we're still on, on track to break ground in January or February um, of 21. So we will, you know, certainly keep everybody updated. But that, that was my bit of good news. <laughs> That's a pretty big bit of very good news. So thank you yeah. for sharing that yeah. with us. Okay, uh, next we've got uh, Jen Bristol. Whoops, got to switch screens here. Uh, okay. I'm trying to unmute you. 
Uh, you want to watch, there you go. Okay. Hey there. Um, I, I don't think, I had a question, so I'm not, I'm not representing um, the dog run or anything. So I don't know if this is the right time for me to state my question. Um, since it's a specific question actually to Jen, yes. And for yes. the purposes and of the minutes, Nobles, if you could just roll this question into the parks report piece, not the third item of the agenda. Great. And Jennifer I, and I have been emailing a little bit about this, but I literally, when you guys started, I was in the park and got harassed by someone who wouldn't move. And I was stuck between it's very frustrating, but um, I was stuck between runners, people with dogs, too close to me, all like crowding in. Like I was stuck on the little triangle trying to move. And I asked the gentleman in front of me, could he just move over a little bit? And he just basically cursed me out. And um, he happens to be, a, I realized I took a picture of him. He's a super across the street from my building. But it was, it was very scary because he just went off on me and said the most horrible things. And there's no one in the parks to ask for help. And there's so many people in the parks and dogs are off leash and people are just like, families are taking up the pads and you can't safely walk. And to be honest, I would be happy not to go in the parks and stay inside for the rest of the quarantine. But sadly, I have to walk my dogs for at least a few minutes a day. And it's really not, it's really, it's really uncomfortable out there. I have anxiety attacks while I'm getting ready to go outside because one of my favorite places in the world is the park and I can't safely walk there without someone not moving, someone taking up the path, um, then now just being cursed at for politely asking him to move a couple of feet away so I can move by with like six feet between us. And there's never anyone in the park. There's never, I saw a pep officer like four weeks ago and that was it. And I feel like it's just gonna get worse as the weather gets a little nicer and everyone's saying that the plateau is coming. So I just wanna put that out there, especially after my issue just a few minutes ago, which was really scary um, because it's only been week four, right? What's gonna happen when it's week six and people are more frustrated and they're just gonna do what they want. So that was my comment or my question. I think we got I think we got the question. Yes. So Fort Tryon is one of the places that does have fixed post park enforcement um, because there has been of the sites that NYPD, the Urban Park Rangers, Parks Ambassadors, and Park Enforcement Patrol have been um, not monitoring the past several weeks. It is a place where we have had lots of violations of social distancing. Um, and I asked them, you know, a lot of it, it seems to happen, you know, people breaking into Javits Playground, say, for instance. Um, but, you know, yesterday after you sent me the video, I forwarded that to the Parks Enforcement Patrol Division, and I said, look, there seems to be a consistent issue over on the, the dong inside of the park. Um, you know, can you please increase patrols there? I don't know you notice with PD, we also had to sort of close down one of the parking lots in the park because people wanted to congregate and didn't want to get caught. It's the parking lot that has, uh, that's sort of not submerged. It's sort of depressed in terms of elevation. So that has had to be closed off because uh, unfortunately, uh, as you point out, a lot of people are unwilling to comply with the social distancing requirements, but um, the Park Enforcement Patrol unfortunately can't be everywhere uh, in Fort Tryon 67 acres, but I did highlight in your video was definitely helpful, the problem around uh, dong and lawn. Okay, thank you. Uh, next on the queue, we've got uh, Alex Campos from the Hispanic Society. Working on unmuting you. Alex, you want to unmute yourself? Yep. Yes. Great, welcome. Hi everyone, thank you, Liz. Uh, I just want to say, I actually had a, re uh, a response to the question about the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum and us, the Spanish Society, we were planning on, while well, they were doing, they were, we were planning on doing something which got delayed by them because they want to focus on their 150th anniversary. And so they had planned to do a big community event in June on Fifth Avenue and around that area and invite museums and other places to collaborate with them with activities 
there in June. And that, you know, information just got sent out like in uh, end of February. And before we could start talking, you know, we closed down and everything. Uh, we had talked to the community people at the Met about doing something up in Washington Heights for the 150th in conjunction, you know, with, with Cloisters in conjunction with the 150th. And they were getting back to us because they really want to focus on the main building. So I just want to let you know about that since somebody asked a question about the cloisters. As far as Hispanic society, as you know, uh, we've been trying to increase our, our virtual or uh, online programming. And in fact, we added several new videos to our website under visit. If you go to visit, there's a multimedia archive which probably has like 10 different videos of lectures and programs that we have done across in different places, including uh, the one in Spain and the one in Albuquerque. There's one in Spanish as well. Um, so that's wonderful. They're also on YouTube and Instagram. We have added some things there as well. We are trying, we had, we were doing our maps workshops in the school. We were in the middle of a program. But, but the, you know, the school's closed down and we actually tried to, we actually converted the program using our maps to continue the lesson plans in the public schools. But unfortunately, the teachers that we were working with put a hold, uh, hold on that because obviously they're having their own challenges and dealing with teaching uh, virtually. So they kind of paused our program indefinitely because they need to focus on the school curriculum. But we are working with one particular school and we hope to launch it in the High School of Law and Public Services in the George Washington campus. And that will be a using our map collection to uh, develop a curriculum of identity and culture and uh, immigration and so forth. So we hope to launch that this spring next week or so. But again, we're waiting for the schools to allow us access to teach these workshops. Um, we also have been able to, we are still offering group tours. It doesn't work for individuals, but if you know of a group who wishes to have a tour, we are organizing uh, private tours for groups, not private tours, but I get tours for groups that can be focused on the Sororio Gallery or a particular item, particular section of the museum. And you just go to visit Sororio at HispanicSociety.org, send an email. And so if you know a group like a school group or an adult club or something that you're involved in, we could arrange a visit uh, virtually with you through Zoom. And basically we give you a password and you all get on that one time. So that's why I can't done, done for individuals. It will be done for groups because you have to have everybody on that group agree to be part of this tiny. Uh, we are also working with, uh, as you know, we do a concert series. Our next concert was scheduled for May 17th. Our public programs manager is working with the musicians and trying to create solo pieces that we could then uh, put on the uh, put on through our website or promote online, so people could enjoy the concerts that we still do, but remotely. Um, so that's something we're working on now, and hopefully we'll have more information about that at the at the May meeting. Uh, uh, but we're trying to target it for May as well. Uh, we're also doing constant. We have some virtual some fun things to do on Instagram. You can use our collection, create your own uh, create your own meets on sen and post it and we'll share it with the public. And we're also trying to do, um, uh, we're doing blogs, uh, staff picks of artwork from the collection. And of course you can sign up for our stuff if you go to our website, hispanicsociety.org and subscribe to our e-newsletter. You can get our weekly updates and kind of the information about activities you can do. For example, Excellent. Saturday, this past Sunday, for Easter, we used a South American scroll and did a collage workshop for kids to do at home. So they could do how to do a collage and make their own scroll. And it was focused on Passover because it was a procession, uh, Easter procession that, 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 that we used from our collection. Great. All right. I'm going to have to move it on to the next speaker. And I'm going to ask that um, speakers try to keep their presentations to minute and a half or so, so that we can um, get through a fairly long stack. So next we've got um, Shiloh Holly from the Morris Jamel Mansion. Good evening, Shiloh. Hi, how are you guys? Uh, so I am providing updates for the Morris Jamel Mansion. Uh, like all of the other, the city's other 22 historic house sites, 
Uh, we are closed to the public. Um, and in the meantime, we are diverting our energy to developing uh, digital programming. So we now have a virtual tour of the museum up on our website. Um, it's morristamel.org. Under visit, you can uh, you can navigate to our virtual tour. Um, additionally, we're in the process of de developing other opportunities. Uh, we have uh, coloring book sheets of the mansion and items from our collection that will be released soon. Um, in addition to creating uh, virtual family workshops that you guys can do at home. Um, and additionally, we're working with schools to figure out how we can continue to serve uh, that population who is planning on coming for a field trip this, this spring. Uh, so a lot of these uh, programs are still in development. Uh, feel free to sign up to, for our newsletter. That's at morristamel.org. Um, and all public program updates to public programs will be listed on our website. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, next up, we've got um, Anastasia. You want to take yourself off of, great. Huh. And are you Anastasia or Anastasia? It's however it rolls off your tongue. <laughs> um, seriously, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, okay. I am reporting from Riverside Park Conservancy. Uh, just one real quick update. I am hosting a virtual volunteer orientation tomorrow. Um, what day is that? <laughs> Tuesday, 14th of April at 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Um, it'll be short and sweet. Uh, just a quick overview of our volunteer program in the park with a focus between 120th to 181st streets. Um, talking about different sites that need some extra TLC, uh, talking about the different capacities in which people can get invo involved as a volunteer. Uh, obviously right now things are on hold. We have canceled our volunteer projects for the spring pretty much like indefinitely right now. We're kind of going as we go through May right now, just working through the cancellations. But so everything's on hold. We don't know when we will be able to hit the ground uh, with volunteers again, but I figure, hey, we might as well have a positive um, meeting on Zoom and, and get more people in the loop as to how they can be part of it once that time comes. Um, so I'm going to, I guess this might be the best way and tell me if I'm mistaken, I'm going to write my email address into the Q&A so that if anyone wants to email me and, and learn more and get the Zoom link and password, please do. Yeah. Uh, everyone can see that, right? Uh, I think most people can see it. And uh, for those who can't see it, it's Anastasia, A-N-A-S-T-A-S-I-A -A -A, at Riverside Park nyc that's all one word dot o-r-g yep and just last thing i am working with the field supervisor aaron who's great um to get him on board as a spanish speaker as well so that is in the works i'm not sure honestly if it can happen by tomorrow uh we've been working as we go but that is also something that um that we're workshopping right now. So that's cool. my update. Stay well, everyone. Um, six foot distance in the parks, please. And yeah. Right on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next up we've got uh, Joanna Castro bringing you in. Uh, okay. Hey. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Hope everyone is well and in good spirits. Um, as you know, this month is Poetry Month, National Poetry Month, and starting April 15th is New York Immigrant Week. Um, so a little trivia there. Um, as maybe a few of you know, we launched on April 1st um, Census Awareness. We will be producing three videos promoting census participation. So hopefully uh, folks will continue to uh, fill the form out. Um, along with the three videos, uh, we have a coloring contest. You can download the PDF and print it and then hashtag uh, 2020 Census Noma 
Um, you can also download it online and color it uh, online. Uh, we will be having a newsletter come out uh, later this week. Um, as always, full of information and news. Feel free to sign up, uh, nomanyc.org. Last but not least, uh, we are slowly transferring uh, public programming online. Uh, we had our first Women in the Heights um, artist talk at the end of March, and now we will be announcing shortly a virtual exhibit and more information on other spring programming, including the Uptown Arts Draw, which we are transferring online as well. So stay tuned for more details. Thank you. Alrighty, thank you. Um, so is there like any kind of opening reception event that's going to be virtual and online or it's just going to be different studios and such? Right now we are looking at uh, doing virtual open studios okay. and slowly building up uh, into other programming. In terms of receptions, that's still TBC. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, we had Marty on the call earlier. I think he's off and I suspect you covered everything for Noma um, as it is. Um, Trish Anderton, you're up. Hey, <clears throat> nice to see you all. You um, so I'm with Inwood Canoe Club and not too much is happening at the boathouse right now. Uh, the water is still too cold to paddle without protective gear. So we have a few paddlers who do have dry suits um, and we have strict rules right now about, you know, not having multiple people inside the boathouse at the same time, not congregating. You know, you basically, you go in, you paddle and you leave. You don't hang out on the dock. You don't socialize, etc. And uh, since our public programs are supposed to start at the end of May, we're now talking about can we offer something? Can we offer programs in a more limited way? Obviously, throwing open our doors to open house and having, you know, a couple dozen people standing in line waiting to get in boats is not going to fly. But once you're on the water, you are socially distanced. So if we can figure out ways to do smaller numbers and keep people apart, then we will try to do that. Excellent, thank you, I appreciate it. And that's, that's actually a really interesting point that by definition you're distanced because of the way a, a kayak is. So that's kind of an exciting um, activity. Um, right. Although getting in the water is, is potentially difficult. So exactly, there's that. a lot of kind of choke points that we need to, we would need to figure out. Got it. Um, all right, uh, Nancy Fiaschetti, Marchetta. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Great, hi, thanks. Thanks so much for doing this on Zoom. It's nice to see everybody. Um, so I'm um, representing Pied Piper Children's Theater, and of course, everything's on hold for us. We were just a couple of weeks away from doing our next production um, of a show that was going to be happening at the auditorium of the Y at uh, the YM and YWHA Washington Heights and Inwood. Um, so of course the kids were super disappointed. We have several kids that were, you know, they're graduating seniors this year. Um, so we're trying to just keep um, them socially connected with our artistic director has still been <laughs> giving them assignments to work on and, and virtual groups that they, virtual, you know, scene study groups and um, rehearsal groups that they've still been having weekly little things to do to keep them busy. And we actually celebrated what would have been our, um, our opening night with a virtual Zoom meeting and run through of the show with everybody. So we're trying to keep um, socially connected. Um, we also are trying to, we're in the works of, um, trying to see if we can help out the Y with our, um, our teenagers volunteering to do um, phone calls to seniors in the community that might need a friendly check-in call. Um, that type of program that's happening in other places, we're trying to connect with the Y to see if we can do that for, you know, within our own community. Um, so that's in the works. And we also have one 
other thing in the works is a video that we're about to release that is just again sort of a virtual sort of an at home activity for kids um, to keep busy during the week um, or really anybody that's interested in musical theater. It's really just like a little a little class a 35 minute musical theater sort of intro class that includes you know dan dance and and uh, vocal warm up and dance warm up and um, uh, things like that to kind of um, pass the time for anybody interested in musical theater. So we are going to have that being released soon. And other than that, we're just really hoping, you know, come hell or high water, we're trying to stay positive and think that maybe we will be able to put on our production eventually, even if it's maybe a free performance for the community in, a, in the park, if that becomes safe at any time in the next few months. Jen, I might be asking you for a park permit. <laughs> Something, um, you know, obviously it's all up in the air, but we're really holding out hope that we maybe can give the kids the chance to um, put on the show that they had worked so hard for. Um, if, you, if you email me, I can give you some information offline on, on uh, I can walk you through uh, a permit. I don't think we need to do that here. Um, right. I can walk you through that. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next up, we've got um, Jim Cataldi. Um, if you've got anything you want to just report on the North Cove, uh, I know that you had a really fantastic video that you released. So if you want to tell us a little bit about that in a minute, I'm trying to unmute you. Without success. There we go. All right, you well, want to give us a minute? Yep, we can hear you. No, I really don't. Um, uh, the Cove is doing well, and um, we look forward to the coronavirus issue being resolved in some form. The Cove is open to the people. They may think the gate is locked, which it is, but the MTA wall to the north has been taken down and you can go enjoy the roughly 13, 14 geese that are there and a few ducks and some other birds that are coming in through the migrations and that's about it. Okay, cool. Thank cool. you for that. I appreciate that. Uh, Danielle, yes. Do you want to unmute yourself? Sorry, where exactly, what, what is the cove? Uh, the, so if you're if you're walking east on 207th Street um, and you see where the old Pathmark was, that's some other kind of supermarket now, and the Flair Beverage, um, and there's a on your right, and there's a BP gas station on your left, and there's a large parking lot which is where that large construction residential 30-story high-rise was going in. Um, just to the north of that, on what would be 208th Street, if there were a 208th Street, um, there's a small bit of um, <clears throat> like beachfront. It's a it's a cove that uh, has been restored as a essentially a wetland. It's quite beautiful, and if you hit me up, I'll take you over there and show you where it is. <laughs> Um, all right, next we got, trip. say what? I said field trip for the summer. Absolutely. Six feet apart. All right, Aisha. I did not know about that place. Hi. Pretty great. So, um, at the last general meeting, I spoke about the 150th challenge that PRX um was doing we actually completed the last day yesterday um prx is the gym that my brother founded at 4875 broadway in inwood um he does a two-week uh 14 day challenge uh generally every two weeks and so this was the 150th challenge since he started doing that he actually started uh running through fort tryon park um, before it became a brick and mortar location. And so uh, he decided because of this crisis to do a virtual challenge so that more people can participate from home. 
um, so that it can alle alleviate, you know, hardships um, that people are having. People are not able to get to the gym, give them something to take, take their minds off of what's going on. And he shot for 1,400 people and got 8,300 people to sign up from all over the world, um, places like Kosovo, Paris, um, Grenada, just like everywhere. Um, and there's, there's just fantastic video of family with kids and all sorts of things that have participated in the challenge. Um, and people that lost like 10 inches, 15 inches, um, total of 18 pounds. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to update about is that he's doing it again. Um, April 27th, there will be another free challenge, um, a 14 day challenge that people can participate in. And so I'll send out information about that. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, all right, so this is a little hard to see. I've got a couple of people who had their hands raised, but they've spoken. So I'm gonna lower those hands. Um, and is there, so I'm lowering all the hands. And if there's anybody who uh, had something else they had to say or who wanted to make a report and didn't get the opportunity to do so, I'm just gonna give everybody a second to re-raise their hands. Scrolling through, not seeing anybody. Okay, so with that, I'm going to um, move to the next item on the agenda, which is, um, oh, actually, uh, yeah, is to the discussion of citizen stewards. Actually, just before we go to that, uh, to that item, um, through Nobles, I just want to remind everybody that for as many reports as we heard from various organizations, there are any number of more organizations um, and artists who are doing things uh, virtually on Facebook, on Instagram, um, on YouTube, um, and so many things on, on websites, so many different ways to engage with other people and in various cultural activities that even though we are inside and apart, there are many opportunities for being together. So um, I'm gonna circulate to the committee, um, sort of a compilation of some of the stuff that I've been made aware of through the borough president and through other sources, Going to give you the, uh, encourage you to add to that, and then we'll send it back out um, to the community board to distribute to the community for um, just some of the many many uh, free resources uh, available to people. So, without further ado, I'm gonna take Nobles <laughs> off mute. Thank you. And. Um, so citizen stewards is this yep. is something that we had talked about uh it actually came out of the conversation when um uh jim cataldi uh, and some folks came from the north cove <coughs> talking about how to have like an organization that uh, a nonprofit, some kind of nonprofit organizational structure that supports the work in the north cove and how do we generally um, provide support as a, as a committee and as a board for volunteers who are trying to do work in um, various parks uh, throughout the community. So, mm -hmm. Nobles. Yeah, great. Thank you for that introduction. And I can probably keep this short because that introduction kind of sums it up. So I'm just going to put some little parts in between. Um, I had not really been open to exactly what a like a, a park steward really is until when when Jim Cataldi uh, came to speak to us about the Cove, um, and then I realized like folks like our own Sally here, also Liz, and a whole bunch of other folks um, have been doing this citizen stewardship, you know, of our parks, which I think is extremely important. And Domingo at the time, who was on the board or this particular committee, rose a good point that he knew of some instances where the the stewards were not really treated fairly, I guess, by the city. That could be conjecture. I don't really know, but it seemed like there was a broad consensus of that. Oh, we are now at night. Thank you, Liz. Um, and so since there was an issue, you know, there, there was a, a supposed issue from that, um, 
I had risen the idea of why don't we make, you know, a type of a, why don't we make a resolution to show our support for um, these, these stewards, but then also maybe put in this resolution uh, some type of language that might push the, the parks department or whoever else, you know, whatever other stakeholding um, agency uh, to give these folks a, a level of officiality. And I'm not really sure if that exists. Uh, if it's some type of a license or something even less than that, um, but just a way for them not to be, you know, either, you know, kind of, um, I'm not going to say harassed, but questioned by the cops when they're doing things in the park, just to show that they know what they're doing. They're recognized by the park. Yes, Jennifer, you probably got my answer already, don't you? You're on mute. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So, um, you know, there is a, uh, a vehicle for people to become permitted volunteers, mm -hmm. to like get to get certain type of training, um, and then to work with the parks department to have sort of a, a mutually determined scope of work uh, for the park. There's a couple different programs. Uh, one is if you want to work in natural areas, you go through the natural area volunteers training. Um, and you can learn about wetlands, you can learn about forests, you can learn about erosion control. Um, and then you, you get partnered with your, you know, either your local park manager or your park administrator um, and sort of jointly come up with a scope of work along with park stewardship division. So wonderful people like Sally um, have gone through the natural area volunteers training. There's also something called the super steward program where you can you know, get training, but um, ultimately what Parks wants to make sure is uh, that volunteers um, aren't undoing, aren't investing their time in something that might then get undone by an upcoming capital project, or volunteers aren't laboring only for the City Parks Foundation or Partnerships for Parks to have already lined up a corporate stewardship or civic stewardship group to come in and do that work. So it's, we're trying to coordinate. So we, we want to equip volunteers, but we also want to direct their efforts so that it helps the park, but it also helps them, uh, you know, uh, ex experience, you know, maximum benefit to, to the parks. And I think Sally is, is obviously one of our best uptown, but we have lots of, um, great natural area volunteers and uh, super stewards uh, and tree stewards. We also have a tree prune, tree, citizen tree pruner program. Um, and all these can be accessed on your website, I'm assuming? So the Parks Department has this, uh, there's a steward, stewardship um, uh, section in Parks website. It tells you about how you become a super steward, how if your group, if you've got a group that wants to do a project, how they can apply for a permit to do that. Um, you can find out resources that Partnerships for Parks provides for people who maybe want to be a steward and then grow their stewardship into, say, more of a friends group or something more structural. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes there's financial support for that through capacity building grants. Um, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, uh, programs in place. Okay. Um, Okay. I just want to bring in. Uh, I want to bring in Danielle, who's been patiently uh, raising her hand. Uh, you want to unmute yourself? I haven't quite figured out. There we go. Thanks. Uh, just a quick question. I wasn't on the board at the time, um, Nobles. It sounds like there was a point or a concern uh, around folks being stopped by the police or questioned about what they were doing. So I guess. Jennifer, my question to that point is, are these stewards being given some sort of um, like identification that they could present to law enforcement in the event that they were asked what they were doing? So on Parkland, generally the way we've handled it uptown is you're given like a permit and then you can have it on your person. Um, and then, you know, in certain instances, we've also had like volunteer lanyards. If you were part of the Highbridge Counts uh, stewardship project, you had a, a lanyard on so members of the public knew you weren't just some random individual asking people how they use the park. You were part of a sort of an authorized project. So, so sometimes there are lanyards um, for like a targeted 
uh, initiative. Um, but there's, uh, if on parkland, if you're working independently and um, have had the, received the required training to do that, then you're given a, a permit. Um, I think the issue might be when someone, you know, maybe is well intentioned but hasn't gone through sort of the process and, you know, is doing something. Um, you know, we had a series of Arbor Side uh, incidents in Inwood Hill, really well meaning person, but they had a very different idea than the Parks Department and Natural Resources Group as to what was best for Inwood's forest. Um, so. So it sounds like anybody that goes through that stewardship training is given some sort of like an identification. Not an ID per se, but I think that's a great idea to work towards that. Like, but um, like a permit that you can have on your person. Okay, great. And it's like a yeah. parks department permit. Yep. And it's got my number on it. It's got the parks logo on it, you know, but cool. Um, a lanyard, you know, ID would be better. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sally, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Yeah, I'll try and speak closer. We also, as natural area volunteers, we also get a license which we can carry with us. And in addition to the parks training, which is great for natural areas, there's also Trees New York does a extensive um, training for street tree stewardship, and that also gives you a license. So and I'm sorry, what's the name of that group? Trees New York. And that's for um, a, a license to be a citizen tree pruner. It's the, a nonprofit partner of NYC Parks. So you can find their information on the Parks Department's website too. Okay, thank you. So Liz, it sounds like there doesn't necessarily need to be a need for a resolution because it sounds like these facilities are already there. This conversation did not come up when this topic came up and I'm, I'm pretty happy with the answers that okay. we've, we've been given. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I wasn't really quite sure if we were gonna need it, but yeah, I, I would say it's an important discussion to have and it's, um, but I don't think we need a resolution. One of the things though that I'm just wondering, um, uh, humor me a little bit. My husband is a very active volunteer with the Red Cross. And one of the things that he has been doing is he's in charge of uh, volunteer training and onboarding new volunteers um, to the Red Cross. And one of the things that he's noticing is since everybody is really bored and working from home or newly unemployed, the Red Cross now has um, a lot more volunteers. So he's actually super busy. So all of that is a long way of asking, is there some kind of messaging that we can get out to the community that there's some kind of training or things that people could be thinking about so that at some hopefully soon future point, if people have this pent up love for the parks that they want to express as volunteers, should we be like crafting a one page go to on here's how you do that? Sure, I can send, I can also send out um, uh, Partnerships for Parks and New Yorkers for Park did a, a fun uh, publication on like how you can help your park and it helps it, it like gives a few different scenarios and it shows you like what your next steps would be um so i can send that to you liz uh to send around and a link to uh parks training um and um okay yeah. Mon monitoring is always a great gift. People send me conditions all the time. I saw a tree down this, I saw that. All of that helps. So information gathering is invaluable as a volunteer. Even if you're not physically changing something, helping inform us is invaluable. Um, you know, the coyote spotting, people were invaluable in providing some of the information, un unraveling that uh, mystery. Um, same with the during the rabies when people saw the sick animals but when you notice some beauty or you see a tree down you know you let me know that's all incredibly helpful thank you uh sally yeah i think the only issue right now is that the formal training programs that are provided by parks and other groups have been suspended so right. sending out something um about how to get trained to do these things is going to people will receive it and then they will go online and find out that everything's been indefinitely suspended. So I think there's an issue there. 
we can tell them what they can do in the meantime or yeah. things to learn about in the meantime to prepare, prepare them right. for when they eventually do get to do hands-on work. And, um, and also, of course, if they're out using the parks, they can monitor. Right. Okay. We actually have, we'll be sending out something. We have equipment that people can borrow if they want to do um, solo stewardship. Well, no one can do solo stewardship unless they've received the training. That's the other issue. You can't use tools. <laughs> well, I was thinking more things like trash pickup. Okay. By tools, just to be clear, Sally, um, by tools, you mean like uh, trash grabbers and stuff? Yeah. How long is a trash grabber? They come in different sizes. You got any that are six feet long? You see where I'm going with this, right? I have a 15 foot one that you can get <laughs> up trees, but most of them are about three and a half feet. So if two people go out with three and a half foot long trash grabbers and they're touching the ends of their trash grabbers to each other, not only can they pick up trash in the parks, but they can also in real time demonstrate for people, this is what six feet looks like. Yep. This could be a thing. I saw a guy walking with uh, a tape measure of six feet, like one of the metal ones through the park, like not harassing people. You but mean just, like this? Yes, just like that. And it was like yep. the most abrasive shit I've seen in a long time. <laughs> I was like, all right, man, I get it. But I understand, like, I'm not mad at you. But like, Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, I think that's an important conversation to have. Um, and again, I can work on putting something together. We can crowdsource our ideas, figure out what's a good way to balance um, giving people the information that they need to be involved in some way without creating a false expectation that they'll be able to you know, go for training, which has actually been canceled um or postponed i'm just wondering francisco francisco since since you're here at this meeting and it's from your home do we get to see that baby <laughs> put him up earlier you guys did you, you guys uh, oh, missed him. Missed him. <laughs> i saw him now, i had him up earlier when we when i first got on the call oh. i put him up for, for like 30 seconds because he was not having it Oh, poor guy. All right. Well, I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Um, if there's anybody who's on the call, who's been uh, just kind of listening in um, and has something to say that they haven't had the opportunity to do so, I'd encourage you to raise your hand. I'm looking at the attendees going once, going twice. Um, so I'm not seeing it. Um, I don't think we have any old business. Um, I don't think we have any new business going once, going twice. Motion to adjourn. Um, I'll take a, a got a, a motion from uh, Nobles. We got a Second simultaneous from Daryl and Danielle. I guess uh, I guess the D's have it. All the D's those have in, it. All those in favor, raise your hands. Uh, oh, hey, Barbara. Uh, all right, there's there's uh, no um, no objection. So I'm just uh, so this meeting is now adjourned. It's um, it's eight oh one, but I'm gonna leave us open and I'm gonna unmute. I'm going to uh, bring in all of the attendees, if I can figure out how to do that. And I can help you out, too. Yeah, if you can just bring in all of the attendees, yep. and I'm going to unmute all of the panelists. And, uh, you know, if there's, if people have the time and the inclination and want to hang out on the call and just get a little bit of socialization, I'm um, happy to stay online for an extra few minutes. I, now that I finally figured out how to unmute, uh, Liz, could I speak for a second? Now that sure. I finally figured out how to unmute, yep. I want to say, in terms of the virtual um, programs the Parks is doing, I think they're great. I think that the senior outreach has to be thought through. Uh, the why with their senior program has really been wrestling with that question. And they have started, for example, a senior exercise program that is going to grow very well. 
and I think it would be good if Clark would try to hook up with the senior uh, in terms of the people they're reaching out to, because many of the seniors are not so tech savvy, and we've been able to get, we've been able for the social workers there to kind of get programs, and if they could then, you know, if parks could reach out to them, the wine will hook them up to the wine for the park too. Let's just get Jen in uh, to answer that. Any suggestions? So we don't have social workers on staff. Um, and since much, much, many of the resources are virtual, um, I think it would have to be, it would have to be sort of something that, um, you know, we, we can send to uh, Wakoa and maybe the aging committee of, of community board 12, here are some things and they can disseminate it out to um, the organizations that um, uh, work directly with, with uh, maybe homebound or, or um, people in senior homes. But if, if you wanna send me contact information, I can let, you know, parks, uh, um, new media know, and I can also do uh, outreach to those service providers if you have contact info. Meeting the um, uh, virtual exercise programs at the Y, I will get you her phone number and email. And it just be main, mainly just maybe giving her what the parks is doing. Hopefully my, she might run with it or- Okay, you know, great, great. Yeah. yeah, and if you could also, Barbara, if you could also reach out to Faye, um, yes. that would be, uh, I'm sorry, not Faye. Well, Mary but, Anderson. The Mary Anderson, Anderson, I think that yeah. would be great. Exactly, I'm just saying, because they're not as tech savvy, we need a little more link up, that's yep. all. Yeah. Super. I have one more question. Yes. Has there, has there been any discussion? Oh. Wait, sorry. Wait second, Liz. <laughs> can you playing. hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Has yes. there been any discussion with the State Department of Recreation or the city, knowing that this is going to drag on, I don't know how long, about the swimming pools this summer. Any contingency, if this long, what will happen? If that long, what will happen? And so forth. I, I, I actually, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I think it is, you're right that it's good to think ahead, but that is way too far ahead. And I think we need to, we're, we're, we are so not there yet. I mean, I know that just from watching Cuomo's daily briefings, the state's answer is absolutely going to be, we are not there yet. So I'm quite sure that the people who need to be thinking about it are thinking about it, but there is no way anybody's putting a policy out on what's happening that far ahead. Right. Upstate has canceled camping permits in the private camps so far. I uh, understood, but once again, I like I just really don't want to get okay. that far ahead of ourselves. Well, I'm just throwing that out that yep. that will be on the horizon. Got you. Yeah. Can uh, can I uh oh I don't know am I next? Can uh, I just yeah we got Daryl and then we got uh Francisco. Oh, I just wait. Can't... is that the baby? What? Okay. No, no, no baby, no baby. He's still sleeping. Uh -oh. Okay. Just a, a quick plug. If you haven't seen it yet on YouTube, uh, the cast of Hamilton did, oh, nice. did the Zoom where it happens. Oh, nice. Check it out. The Zoom where it happens. Nice. Will do. Uh, all right. We got uh, Francisco. Were you raising your hand or adjusting your camera? I was just adjusting my phone. Oh, okay. Uh, Sally. Yeah, just a note for cultural organizations and individual artists, there's a lot of resources out there in terms of grants and stuff that can be applied for. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. I actually had a whole document on that. There's, um, there's a, a, a series of, there's a grant through the Robin Hood Foundation 
uh, which is for nonprofit organizations. They don't fund individuals, but they are doing grants um, for organizations up to uh, 45, grants of up to $45,000 for organizations. There's also um, a huge initiative from the hospital, a $10 million initiative from the hospital for uh, uptown businesses and nonprofits. It's $10 million over two years, the first $2 million of which is available immediately for um, brick and mortar organizations and also for nonprofits. It's being administered through the Hispanic Foundation, um, but it's for any um, business or nonprofit uh, that has a demonstrable loss uh, directly attributable to COVID. Um, Bloomberg Philanthropies and a number of foundations have created a $75 million NYC COVID-19 response and impact fund um, for not only, it's mostly for social service organizations, but also for cultural organizations that have been affected by the crisis. Um, and uh, last Friday, the borough president did have a, um, uh, like a, a, a symposium on different resources for uh, artistic and cultural organizations, primarily in West Harlem, in Harlem and West Harlem. It wasn't so much focused on uh, Community Board 12, but there was some good information there and it's been uploaded to YouTube so that you can listen to that and get some information from there. Um, and that's all I got on grants. Uh, I, I will share that maybe the most interesting oddball tidbit of cultural programming available online is that the, uh, well, the Museum of the City of New York had had a really interesting uh, exhibit on the 1918 uh, pandemic, which of course is of much greater interest to us all now than it was, oh, six weeks ago. But the, I'm just looking for it. In 2002, there was a leather trunk discarded on a sidewalk that uh, in Lower Man Manhattan, and the person who found it opened it and realized that it was that it contains all of the cherished keepsakes of a 19th century New York City woman. Um, so the Merchants House Museum has this incredible online exhibit that walks you through all of these artifacts. It's incredibly cool. So um, that'll be in the document that I'm sending around as well. Uh, anybody, else, anybody else got anything to add? Hands raised, going once, going twice. All right, well, everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, Nobles, for taking minutes. Um, I will see you again next month, and hopefully I will see some of you at the um, general board meeting, which I believe will be taking place again via Zoom on uh, April 28th. So, okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.